Celtics B is brought to you by FanDuel, the exclusive wagering partner of the CLNX Media Network. All right. Okay. Jeez. Uh, like, do we have to? Do we, do we even have to talk about this right now? I had said this is Celtics beat Adam Kaufman. Dan Greenberg is here, Evan Valenti. He really wanted to be here, but honestly, it's probably good psychologically for him that he is not. But I promise he is still part of it. He is producing the show, and he will be back for the next show, so not to worry. Ev, we're, we're doing you a solid here, you not having to be put through sort of reliving what has happened over the last few days. So the last show we did, Greeny, was a preview of the series. And I, I think, honestly, if, if anyone were, if you missed that show and you wanted to go listen back for any reason, maybe had a, a happier time in our lives, uh, there was, the warning signs were there. Like, we were very, very deliberate about Miami just scaring the crap out of us and not taking anything for granted. And now, as we fast forward to real time on the heels of yet another double digit lead at home blown in the playoffs and losing to the heat in a game that just felt as it got later and later that it was going to turn, that it was going to go the other way. I I said to somebody earlier when Jimmy Butler came in, the Celtics were up whatever it was, seven points or so with like seven and a half minutes left. I had zero confidence. Boston was going to win that game. I really did. I I really did. And now they are down. Oh, two dropping two games at home, going to Miami. Let's just, let's just cut to the chase. And then we can, we can do the work around with everything. Let's just cut to the chase, the meat of the whole thing. What is your confidence level that Boston is going to come back and win this series, not make it a series, not be in this series, win this series. Um, confidence. I mean, I don't think they're dead. I don't know what percentage you want to put on it, but I do think there's the realization that if they do come back and win it, they're going to be doing something that no team in the history of the NBA has ever done. So it's like, on one hand, you think, okay, you know, if they play to their potential, it's not surprising that they split or win both in Miami. I mean, as crazy as that sounds, it's also crazy to think that they just lost the first two games in their own building, right? I think even if you were concerned with the heat or you respected what they're doing, you know, that fear that you mentioned, I think at worst, people were thinking they split, sure. right? I think even, even dropping the opener wasn't like completely out of left field because we have seen what they've done in their most recent game ones, not only against the Heat, but earlier this, you know, this playoff run. So it's just as improbable that they would drop two at home. Maybe they win both. It's just one of those things where at some point, you know, you're not different from the rest of NBA history, right? Like there's that realization that you had that opportunity to split, be up 2-0, have the momentum with the finals right there. And they have, like in the finals, choked away the opportunity that we've all been waiting and, and they've been working for. It's like everything we've been told, they were backing it up. And then they got to the final stage of getting over the hump And how do you explain up nine with six minutes and you don't win that game? And you have perfect health. You're you're at home. Like things are you. There are no excuses. Right. Like you weathered the Miami comeback and you rebuilt the lead. Even in the fourth quarter, you were kind of going back and forth. But then, you know, Grant put you up nine. I think for me, the moment where I thought we were in trouble was right after the Jimmy Butler and one. Tatum came back in the game. There was like 6.29 left in the, in the fourth. He had that pump fake wide open three at the top of the key that he missed. And that's when I thought, uh-oh, like we're leaving. Like that's the kill shot, right? Because then yeah. you go from six back to nine. Now you're right around five minutes. Like granted, they still could have blown that lead. But I think they got tight because they just weren't. Ma- I think they finished two of ten. Grant was the only one to make a shot. Then you have the Marcus Smart turnover where it just inexplicably slips out of his hands with two minutes left, and then Butler hits the jumper up too. So it's like every bit of the the losing plays and the backbreaking momentum mistakes that we lived through last year, back-to-back games have now cost them the first two of this series. And at some point, it's like, yes, they're resilient. 
their their talent can be successful, but the talent has to show up, and the talent has not shown up in these first two games. And when you mix that with the fact that the Heat are locked in, I mean, is anybody surprised that they're 0-2 given the quality of basketball they're playing? They're not playing a brand of basketball that deserves to even be split in the series. And I think that is what's more frustrating because there's no excuse for them to be playing this way other than they're just choking it away. And for whatever reason, because Pete, like we'll get to this a little bit later. I don't even want to do this right now, but people will point to Joe Missoula. Previously, they pointed to Ime Odoka. They certainly for years pointed at Brad Stevens. And I mean, there there are common denominators here and it's not the coaches. (laughs) I mean, it's there. there, there's a certain right? there's a certain amount of this that is in and and I don't want to dismiss what they've done. Going to the East Finals, much of this core five times in seven years is a difficult freaking thing to do. But there's something in their DNA that just doesn't allow them to recognize the moment until after and have to respond to it, as opposed to knowing what is at stake more than consciously, but in terms of just attitude and demeanor and disposition in the moment that you have to take advantage of it rather than react after the fact. And I don't know what it is about Tatum Brown, smart and company, you know, got Horford, even like guys who have, have been through the ringer have been here, who have been part of this, who have, who have experienced this, that it just keeps happening again. And I'm not even talking about all the times it happens during the regular seasons in the games that matter, the playoffs, you think back to the finals last year. And, and I just thought if we were so fortunate, as to have a healthy group this time of year again. A healthier group, a deeper group, quite frankly, than what we saw in the playoffs last year and against the Warriors. For them to go down the way that they did, I'm not going to say they blew it against Golden State, but it was absolutely a missed opportunity. It was absolutely a championship they could have won. To not take advantage of that, to then have to stew in it, in, in the days and weeks and months that followed all to build up to where you are again right now and toy around with the Hawks and let the Sixers take you seven games and then be in this position against a team that fears nobody, that fears nothing. From Pat Riley to Eric Spolstra to Jimmy Butler on down, this is a group that is not intimidated by any situation and you let yourselves get to a point where you are down Oh two going back to their house. I don't understand how mentally that happens. I think it's just, I mean, part of it is just Jimmy Butler's will, right? Like, but it's not only that it's how they have all sort of, they're all like, they rise together, right? Like Jimmy goes up, Caleb Martin goes up, Gabe Vincent's making big plays down the stretch. Max Struess is hitting big threes. So it's sort of like, you know, the tide raises all ships. On the Celtics side, just look at the last six minutes of that game. Did anybody on Miami look rushed or panicked or like they were going away from things that made them successful? No. Like Jimmy Butler was in control of his environment. He was in control offensively of getting to his spots. You look at at the Celtics side. They're sort of panicking against the zone. They're giving the ball to Tatum 30 feet from the rim so that he's easy to triple team. Then from there, the best players aren't showing up, right? Jalen has the travel. He has the the forced missed shot on the putback with four minutes left. He gets the offensive rebound, bring it back out, run a play, get a good look. He goes back up and gets it, uh, gets it blocked. Not to mention all the times they're getting beat back door, you know, ball watching in these big moments. So, Part of it is the mindset and sort of the the preparedness of, listen, the Heat had 54 clutch games this year more than anybody in the league. They were 32 and 22 in the clutch. This is how they win. They they keep it close, and then they say, our guys are going to beat you down when it means more in the final moments. Same thing with Bam. Bam didn't shoot all that great, but when it came time to make an impact play, who was there with the biggest offensive rebound, right? Not the four Celtics all standing around the rim going for the ball. Bam brings it in, dunks it, five-point lead, the game's over. So I think part of it is when when the Celtics start to miss these shots and don't get stops on the other end, then you get the careless turnovers 
like with Maxi when Brogdon threw him the ball. Last night when Smart fumbles it with two minutes left in a tie game. You add that all together, that's how these collapses happen. And you look at it and you say, okay, it's happened. You know, they had their issues against Miami with Brad, with his soft switching, with how they couldn't break the, uh, you know, the zone in the bubble. Mm -hmm. Then Emo comes in. We still got a 33 to 14 third quarter in game one. We still had high turnovers with Ime for in every loss of that series. And now here we are. They have 30 turnovers in two games. They're not getting stops. They're giving up 46 points in the third quarter and then 36 points in the fourth quarter last night at home. It's at this point, it's like until the best players on the team figure it out, nothing's going to change, right? We said, oh, bring them different guard help. Bring in Brogdon for the offense. Brogdon played nine minutes in the fourth quarter. They didn't, you know, they didn't pull away. So it's, it's, there's no, coaching fix there's no oh they need this piece that piece fixed it's on the players on the roster to play to their potential in these big moments and until they do you're going to keep running into the same thing now that doesn't mean you trade Jalen or you you trade you know Tatum or Smart like you have enough to win but that requires those players to come through in the biggest moments when it happened in game six against Philly, they looked great. When it came through in game seven against Philly, it came great. When they had to close out the Hawks in game six, they found out a way to do it. So that for me is the annoying part is like, we see them do it, but yet for whatever reason, when the finals are on the line, you're at home, you're facing your boogeyman. They just, they just mentally can't get over that hump. And I think Jimmy Butler knows it. He knows that if it's within six points, in the last four minutes, the yeah. Heat are going to win that game. And I think that's the problem. And can we not, by the way, with the, and I, I don't know that, I, I'm a, I'm just assuming you were not doing this, but I didn't check Twitter, so I don't know for certain. But even the fact that it was a talking point, even the fact that people were were asking Jalen Brown or whoever else about it post game, the whole Grant Williams, like, poking the bear with, yeah. with Jimmy, like, the dumb, of all the dumb storylines, that yeah. might be the dumbest. Like and I tweeted this out, and I don't remember exactly what I wrote, but the 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 nuts and bolts of it were basically if if Jimmy Butler needs to be woken up by Grant Williams getting in his face, then Jimmy Butler is not the man that I think he is. That yeah. game would like nothing about that game would have been any different if that moment does not happen. Grant Williams, like I'm sorry, like all due respect yeah. to Grant. Grant is not that guy that is gonna like, oh, well, all right. I Jimmy, Jimmy Butler's up now. If only we hadn't put Grant out there in his grill, then you know, this might have won that game. It's just, it's so I, I don't know why we sort of get obsessed with moments like this as if they actually sometimes they do matter. You know, that like here's the thing. There are a lot of, and I I don't know if Grant is this guy or not? I, I don't, you know, it, it wouldn't seem like it because Grant's a nerdy guy and, and, and I like, so am I. So I don't say that as any sort of an insult or anything like that, but there are a lot of like fake tough guys. You know what I mean? There are a lot of fake tough guys, especially on a basketball court. Let me tell you something. Jimmy Butler's not one of them. Jimmy Butler is someone that I believe that if, if, if he wanted to, he would throw down with you right there on the floor. Suspension fines, whatever be damned. Jimmy Butler's not a guy I'd want to piss off. You know, like, I'll get in somebody's face if I know somebody's right there holding me back, making sure the other person isn't about to throw. But Jimmy Butler would throw. <laughs> so I, I don't know what Grant's even thinking of doing in that moment. I looked at it like this. I think, you know, we were when when Butler came back in at the 722 mark. Right. I think every Celtics fan was like, OK, we're going to get the the usual Jimmy Butler put the team on, on his back close. Right. Like that's what he did in game one. It's what he's done in literally every game this playoff. So I think we were all expecting it before Grant made the three and jawed at him before they went head to head. Like at that point of the game, in that situation, that's why Jimmy Butler is Jimmy Butler. Everyone watching that game was just waiting. Okay, now he's in. He's going to get to his spots. He's going to do his thing. When Grant and him went head to head, the only thing I thought to myself was, now I know we're going to get it, right? Like, <laughs> I look at it like this, uh, the whole, like, getting a rise, motivating, waking up the beast, that was Giannis trash-talking Al and then Al dunking on him because that's not something that Al does. So you're right. like, oh, my God, where did that come from? 
Jimmy Butler ripping your heart out by getting to his spots and hitting jumpers is what he does. So it's not like Grant brought out something that, you know, wasn't expected or you don't see a lot. Right. For me, it just said to the, me like, okay, if there was a 10% chance that Jimmy wasn't going to close this game strong, it's now zero. Yeah. But it just meant that the execution on the Celtics side had to be flawless and it was anything but. So I do not think that, you know, the Celtics were on their way to win that game. He got in Jimmy's face and Jimmy changed the course. They were already sort of teetering well before that dust up. And Grant was the only one to make a basket after that happened. So it's like, even if you want to blame him for that and say that's the reason you lost, how can that be the case if every other player didn't hit a shot and turned it over other than Grant? So I would say that's the wrong takeaway to have. But in real time, I tweeted it out. I was like, all right. You can't do this to Jimmy Butler because now we know with certainty he's going to make you pay for it. And I don't I don't, like this show generally, you know, and we're coming at you twice a week now. Thanks to our great sponsors. This is not a show that generally dives too deep into the weeds of being like a game recap podcast. You know, we've got other shows on the network for that, like the Garden Report, for instance. This is more of a, a look ahead and a big picture and all of that. But there are just some things to talk through because I feel like people are obsessed with the wrong things. And again, we'll get to coaching because there's a, a much bigger element of the conversation that surrounds Joe Missoula. But when you think back of these two losses at this point, I, I don't understand how Jason Tatum doesn't get a shot off. And I realize he was fouled a few times, but doesn't get a shot off in the fourth quarter of game one. If, if he's, you know, that guy, I don't understand how in game two and people just have off shooting nights and, and, but like, Maybe it's simplistic, and I again, I tweeted this because I do feel this way watching the game. Like, if Jalen Brown has even a representative night, let alone a good night, they yeah. win that game, maybe even going away, or maybe it's close or whatever, but they win the game. Jalen yeah. Brown was horrendous in game two. That's not in character, doesn't happen often, but we're going to call it out when it happens. He was horrendous in game two. So if he's not, they win. Or if you, even if he is, if you, if you want to say, all right, well, be better on the glass, rebound, don't get crushed there, you win. Don't turn the ball over a ton more times, you win. You know, don't shoot sub 30% from three-point range, you win. Quick break to tell you today's show is powered by FanDuel. Make a fast break to FanDuel during the NBA playoffs right now. It's winding down, not a lot of chances to make money on these games anymore. I mean, it's just just the volume isn't there anymore. You're missing out. Right now, new customers get a no sweat first bet up to one thousand dollars. It's one thousand dollars in bonus bets. If your first bet does not win, thanks to us here at Santos Media and of course Celtics beat. Love FanDuel. Best thing about FanDuel are the same game parlays, and I love to try and build the script. If you get what I'm saying in terms of how the Celtics are going to win a game, so let's talk about Game Three, a pivotal do or die game for the Boston Celtics. Line is minus three and a half. Celtics on the road in Miami for this. And Tatum has been out of his mind pretty much this entire series so far. So Tatum has scored 20-plus. Tatum has scored 6-plus rebounds. And to collect 6-plus assists, again, the Celtics covering, minus 3.5, plus 327. Not bad. Not bad at all. I just And recently, again, the app is the best way to use this. Open my app to give me a promotion. It's, it's the best. They give you promos all the time. The app is safe and secure and it's easy to use. And you get paid instantly, which is the best part. There's no better way to bet on all the playoff action for the NBA and other sports in America's number one sports book. That is FanDuel. Visit FanDuel.com slash Boston. Get a no-sweat first bet up to $1,000. It's FanDuel.com slash Boston for a no-sweat first bet up to $1,000. FanDuel, the official sports betting partner of the NBA. 21 plus in select states. First online real money wager only. $10 $10 deposit required, a refund issued as non-withdrawable bonus bets that expire in 14 days. Restrictions apply. See full terms at FanDuel.com backslash sportsbook. FanDuel is offering online sports wagering in Kansas under an agreement with Kansas Star Casino, LLC. Gambling problem? Call 100GAMBLER or visit FanDuel.com slash RG in Colorado, Iowa, Michigan, New Jersey, Ohio, Pennsylvania, Illinois, Tennessee, and Virginia. One enter next step or text next step to 53342 in Arizona, 1 888 789 7777, or visit ccpg.org slash chat in Connecticut, 
1-800-9 with it in Indiana. 1-800-522-4700 or visit ksgamblinghelp.com in Kansas. 1-877-770 stop in Louisiana. Gamblinghelplinema.org or call 800-327-5050 for 24/7 support in Massachusetts. Visit www.mdgamblinghelp.org in Maryland. 1-877-8-HOPE-NY or text HOPE-NY. That's 467-369 in New York. 1-800-522-4700 in Wyoming or visit 1-800-GAMBLER.net in West Virginia. There are a lot of different things. That, that's why like, it shocks me after a game like that that people even consider pointing at the coaching staff because of all the underperformances that happened on the floor. But I just think that there are you know, going forward in the series, especially when you have to go to Miami and you think about that environment, it's not so much like the, the environment in terms of the fans, because it's sort of fair weather fans there. Obviously it's, it's not a, it's not like a hostile environment. Even when LeBron was there, it wasn't a hostile environment like it is coming to Boston, but there are just well, is Boston even a hostile environment? Well, anymore? I mean, it, it, it I'm, everyone it's a, seems to win as soon as they step onto that. Floor. It's a good question. I mean, I, I think the fans for the most part, do their job like that building was rocking last night um obviously the the you know the players didn't do what they were supposed to do and that's why they're well like sub 500 in in the last 20 games or something like that playoff games at home but i i guess where i'm going with this is i i felt better i don't want to be all doom and gloom that's not generally my personality as it relates to the celtics and you're someone who's kind of like Homer adjacent, if you will. That's how I think of you. Like, you know, you you play a certain character on Twitter, but intellectually you do think about this team reasonably. I felt better about this team down 3-2 to the Sixers than I do down 0-2 to Miami. Yeah, because I, well, I just think it's different just because I think the opponent is tougher. Um, You know, I think how Philly beats you and how Miami beat you are wildly different. Um, I, I think the biggest issue and probably why you're feeling that way is yes they blew and threw away games against the Sixers but it was on like it's one thing to lose on a game winning shot right you can kind of compartmentalize that it's like listen you know a guy makes a a step back three like it's a make or miss lead against the Heat it's more process oriented right it's not they're not losing on a game winning shot that hey you know, credit Jimmy, it's multiple possessions, right? It's Jason Tatum not taking a single shot after six minutes and nobody figuring out whether it's Joe or the other players on the roster, how well should we be getting our best player the ball? He hasn't made a shot in this fourth quarter. He took all of his shots in his first stint before he came back after the the Jimmy Butler and one. And when you're looking at Jalen Brown, he was horrendous, but he's not alone. Smart was nowhere to be found. Al Horford is killing this team with his inability to make an open look. And if he's not rebounding, it's killer. So they were you daring at, him to shoot in game two. Right. So daring him to shoot. You just listed off 60% of the starting lineup. So you're not going to beat a good Miami team when 60% of your starting lineup doesn't show up. So then you think, okay, like when they get into the five you know, last five minutes. Where's uh, our, where's Rob? Where's Derek? Where's Brogdon? And like, that makes sense to a degree, but at the same point, like if the ball is going to filter through Tatum and Brown anyway, in those situations, and they're going to either turn it over or not take shots and not come through, it doesn't matter who else is on the floor because you're just giving, you're just playing through those two guys with no variation, right? How many times do we just see, Tatum get the ball 30 feet from the wing, you know, right around that hash mark. And you already have the two guys because it's a, you know, sort of like a box and one. So while Jalen or the corner guy looks open, they had Struess there who was sort of hedging and taking that pass away. And they're the same way that they were breaking that zone and that pressure in the third, you know, second and third quarter, we didn't see it one time. And I think that's where Missoula comes into play. That's where the veterans on this team have to say, hey, like, let's just realize we're playing like idiots right now and get back to what made them successful. Because in the quarter before it, they won it 33 to 21. They were moving the ball on offense. They were taking care of, you know, what they had to do to break the zone. And the fact that their best players can't recognize that from Horford 
to Smart, to Tatum, to Brown matters. And then if Joe's not going to do it, it's a recipe for disaster. And that's how you fall apart. Let's take a quick break. Tell you about our uh, good friends at BetterHelp. This show is brought to you in part by BetterHelp. Getting to know yourself, it can be a lifelong process. You probably could, we could all stand to, you know, do a better job of that, uh, whether on a, a personal level, a professional level, or as a sports fan, as it relates to the Boston Celtics and our fandom at this moment. But it can be a lifelong process, especially because we are always growing. We are always changing. Life's throwing you new curveballs, wrinkles, uh, a lot of things that you go through mentally and emotionally and all of it. Sometimes you just need someone else to help you get through it rather than going through it alone. Obviously there are tough times and it's good to better understand, uh, you know, how to cope and how to get through. And that's where better help comes into play. Evan, of course, Evan Valenti, big part of this show swears by the service uses it regularly. If you're thinking about starting therapy, do give better help a try. It's entirely online. So incredibly convenient designed uh, to be flexible around your schedule, suited to your schedule, completely convenient as well, because obviously you can fit it in around work or family stuff, kids, sports, whatever it may be. You don't have to go anywhere. Just go hide out in a room in your place and and hop online and talk to someone who can help you out and just listen and give you advice or or just tips in terms of how to cope and how to manage, because again, we all have those challenges. So Fill out a brief questionnaire. You can get matched up with a licensed therapist. If one does not work for you, you can switch therapists at any time, no additional charge. You can discover potential and your potential with BetterHelp. Visit betterhelp.com slash beat. That's B-E-A-T. Today, get 10% off your first month. Betterhelp, H-E-L-P dot com slash beat. All right, let's get back to the show. I feel like that's a relevant ad. To- it's, it's, very, it's, it's very relevant right now. <laughs> I feel like we could all can we, can we do group therapy with better help just to talk no, about they're like a discount rate or something. <laughs> um all right, I, I so I saved the Joe Missoula stuff because I feel like this is going to be a longer conversation. Uh, you know, coaches are I've tweeted about some of this stuff and I I haven't even read a good chunk of the mention. I hundreds of responses to stuff that I have tweeted or just you know tweets initiated uh this all centering around the coach. I know you have received uh, probably even more than I have. You make it a point to respond to some of them. I need to be better about it, but some of them just drive me crazy. There's a, so a lot of you know nonsense out there, obviously. But in in thinking about sort of, all right. Well, let's go one at a time. People get obsessed with the timeout thing. I did not think timeouts or a lack of timeouts or untimely timeouts. I didn't think that was like that. Didn't bother me in game two at all. You want to say that Eric Spolster is a little more aggressive with his, maybe doesn't let the the run go quite as long. Fine. You know, that's, that's okay. I, I think to be fair, there was the 21 to two run in the second quarter. The Celtics went on, right? Like, right. And there was the time where Spolster took his time out when it got, you know, down to two and then the Celtics bumped it back up to seven. So it's, yeah. it's not the, the end all be all fix that people I think sometimes it as yeah and i and and we've spent plenty of time on previous shows with with the timeouts and stuff so we don't need to go too hard on that but the you know i just i come back to and i've said this a lot i've said this for months that i think generally speaking in the nba especially coaching is overrated when you have a contending team as compared to you know a rebuilding team or a mediocre team i think like the you know the worse you are the more important coaching gets basically and the better you are and the more loaded you are talent ultimately is what is going to win you a championship but i think some of that and this is sort of what i'm realizing the more tweets i get about like joe sucks he's got to go you know how can you even say he's above average or or good or you know you don't win this is sort of the conclusion I came to driving earlier. You don't, at least I believe this, someone will probably disagree, Dan, but you don't win, what was it, 57 games in the regular season? I think they won. You don't win 57 games, get to the East Finals, come back from down 3-2 to get there in the conference semifinals. You, you, like, you don't, you don't reach this stage. You don't go through all of that, especially first year on the job, being thrust into the situation in training camp, and you know, having barely been an assistant in the league and go through all of these things, you know, I'm not going to go through Joe Missoula's, you know, in-season resume, but you go through all of these things and you get to this point, 
Never mind the finishing third and coach of the year voting. Like, dismiss that. I don't even care. Ignore that for the moment. You don't achieve what they as a team have achieved in spite of your coach. I just don't believe yeah. that. It, like, it, your coach has something to do with it. You don't yeah. want to give him tons of credit and, and say he's at Spolster's level? Fine. I'm not saying that. You're, you're comparing him to the best active coach in the NBA right now who is on the other side with a team that is not as talented as yours but doesn't suck either the way a lot of people wanted to dismiss them going into the series saying this should be a sweep or a gentleman sweep for the Boston Celtics. I yeah. do not believe that Joe Missoula is just along for the ride. Is he a little slow to make some adjustments? Do some of his in-game responses or reactions need to be questioned or dissected further? Could, you know, could he uh, you know, be, be, you know, could the the rotation's been a bit of a mess lately? Could, could some of those areas improve? Of course, he's not infallible. You know, he's, he's, he's not without questioning, right. but I just don't think he is this guy that is all of a sudden the reason that you're down Oh, two. And I mean, let's not forget if they win tomorrow and are down two to one, that's the exact same position that he was in through three games in last year's conference finals. So how could he? No, but don't you remember he sucked too? Right. So he may also had to go. I look at it like this: he's definitely not why they're losing the games, right? But there are things that he either is not doing or decided to try and have failed that have not helped them get over the hump, right? Like for example, double bigs did not work in game one. The numbers showed it. The eye test showed it. It got rocked. He stayed with it in game two, and you're thinking, wait a minute. Like, we already know that this kind of doesn't work against the Heat. It had a minus 15 net rating last year. It's just, for whatever reason, it just doesn't work, right? He does make the adjustment at halftime to move away from it. So I don't doubt that he doesn't know how to make halftime adjustments. And it obviously worked because they built that lead back in the third quarter. Mm -hmm. the only rotational issue you could say is the last four minutes when you know they couldn't get a rebound they couldn't score and you're arguably three of your five best players between rob brogdon and Derek didn't weren't on the floor for the final four minutes but at the same time when you look at who was on the floor like grant earned his his minutes like yes jimmy butler hit those jumpers over him, but they were good contests. So it's mm -hmm. like he was the only one that was giving you anything at the time. So I can understand why he's maybe in over Derek. Now, whether Derek should have been the guard to come in at the four minute mark instead of smart when Brogdon came out. Okay. That's a legitimate Derek was having a great game and smart was just, it was a, a brutal night for him. So, yep, that's valid. Defensively, their best lineups were ones that had Al Horford as the big guy, right? Like that should, you can look it up. All of their lineup data said when they played with the small lineup in Horford, they had like an 81 defensive rating in that game in the 11 minutes that it was used, which was more than any lineup in the league or in the, uh, in the game. Mm -hmm. So to me, it's like he had the right people at times where I think he failed them is on the executional and the strategy side. There's no, how am I going to make life tougher on Jimmy Butler? Even if I have to sell out for a couple of these possessions, I want to, let me see if Gabe Vincent can make this three. And if he makes it, great. Let me see if Caleb Martin, although he was having a great game, that's still better than getting Jimmy Butler one-on-one -on -one shots, right? Especially when you're looking on the other end and you're seeing how, Spo is making life tough for Tatum. The fact that there was no, let's just try something for a possession or two defensively is a problem. On the other end, the fact that there was no variation to how they were attacking that box in one is the sort of in-game adjustment I think we're all looking for. Obviously, they'll watch film on it, and I'm sure they'll be better if they see it. The issue there is you're running out of games to figure it out. So, that's why I think maybe the inexperience hurts them. But the issues of why they lost this game are player related above anything else. You like Joe Missoula isn't dribbling the ball off Jason Tatum's foot. 
he's not, you know, traveling or, you know, fumbling a ball or, you or know, Malcolm not- Brogdon throwing a ball right at the other team. Right. Like that is, or not putting in the effort. And I'm not talking about Brogdon, anybody not putting in the appropriate effort and energy on the glass. Right. Like at some point, like it's clear that he's saying, okay, I'm going to trust the best players on my roster to hold down a nine point lead with six minutes left. I think it gets, it gets so crazy where you're, I had people saying, Oh, Joe Missoula took Tatum out in the second quarter for two minutes. What an idiot. It's like, what do you mean? They were up 11 points and he played 17 straight minutes. Like that is when you give him a rest. If the players aren't going to maintain the lead, that's on them. Like you have to be able to give Tatum 120 seconds of rest. What are we even talking about? So I think things like that, the timeout issue, that's what people harp on. And I think that's the misguided part. The valid stuff is there's no validity. There's no creativity an adjustment of if Butler every single time in the last two minutes is getting a high screen, getting to his right hand and pulling up, I immediately have to take that away from him and make them beat us a separate way. The same way Spolstra said, if Tatum has the ball and has even two guys on him, he's going to beat us. We need to get three guys on him and we're going to make a smart, a Jalen, a Horford beat you. And they couldn't. That I think is the biggest difference is, Everybody on Miami side had the buy-in of what they were going to do once the game got to a certain moment. I do not think there's that same level of structure when the Celtics get into these under five minutes. They know this is the plan. This is how we're going to execute it. That is the stuff that I think falls on Missoula. I do wish, I guess it would have had to have been Washburn, just historically speaking. I wish Gary post-game had said to Joe, so Joe, your team won two of four quarters. She hates Washburn, though. They have a they have a beat. Did you it's, find that you guys very, weren't prepared enough? <laughs> yeah, it's very apparent when you hear how Joe answers Washburn's questions. Yeah. There's like there's tension. Cause I think Washburn well, he's also actually, just he's very snippy. Like he's very defensive. And I'm not even saying like I I, I can't even fathom. I can't I, I can't imagine being in that position. Like maybe, maybe I would be too. I don't know. Like, or certainly I would feel it even if I didn't outwardly, you know, say it, you know, answer questions the same, but yeah, he is, he's, he doesn't like to be challenged. He doesn't like to be questioned. Well, I think, see, I disagree. Cause I think there are questions that he gets that are challenging or sort of, you know, questioning his, what he was thinking but they're basketball questions. I think what he doesn't respond to is like the gotcha. We're going to get the media quote, you know, for our story viral, whatever. Right. Like part of me thinks when he gave that we won the one quarter, that was literally the exact thing that he may said when they lost that third quarter in game one, 33 to 14, he said the words we won three out of the. So I think part of me is thinking like, is he kind of trolling just by like, you know, because they're trying to get this gotcha? It, it just makes no sense. Know, it's, it's it seemed pretty genuine. Like he 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 he's in because it was a question about preparation. And I think he was saying, you know, we won three out of four quarters. Like we were prepared, we just had one awful quarter. Right, uh, but I think that's what I mean. Like the question saying, was more yeah. like uh <laughs> the question was more like a gotcha, like Joe, you don't know how to do your job right. to feed into this idea right. that I don't know, you know, if he had you know, I feel like whenever Corrales asks him a question and it's like basketball related, you get a more genuine answer with real yeah. basketball reasons. When it has to be Joe, what do you mean? You guys you couldn't prepare your own team for the biggest quarter of the season? He's like what the hell are you talking about? Why are you trying to frame it? Like, I don't know what I'm doing. We were ready. We just played a really poor quarter. Yeah. Here's why. And whatever he says in the here's why part, people don't really care about because he's already coming off defensive. If we could squash something now that I, I mean, I don't know how many times I've already said it or tweeted it, but what the hell it keeps coming up. So let's just squash it again. I assume you agree, but if you don't, by all means say so. Joe Mazzulla is not going anywhere. Like, no, they're, no. like they're like b- people either people either want him gone, and that's just like whatever fans are fans. But I mean, I've seen people in the media say that if it, like if they blow this, if they don't reach the NBA Finals, he's gone. He's he's out the. 
they just gave him the job like a matter of oh, months yeah. ago. They they just took the interim tag off. They just gave him a new contract. It would be a terrible reflection upon Brad Stevens and his decision making and the role that he's in upon ownership in the way that they conduct their business. Like it would it would be a worse look to get oh, yeah. rid of Joe, even if you underachieve, than to keep him for the organization. This way. Look at it this way. That would be like saying, oh, Ime had to be fired because Jason Tatum had a terrible finals, right? If Jason Brown is going to go 7 of 23, what the hell does that have to do with why you should keep or fire your head coach? Because guess what? They could have a new head coach, and if Jalen's going to go 7 of 23, that coach is going to lose the game too. So when you're talking about does this team have enough to win, the answer is yes. It's if that talent can execute it. Like, if they come back and win this series, oh, what, does that mean Joe should get a lifetime extension? Like, ultimately, I think when it comes down to do the do the players buy in, obviously, like, we just watched 100 games of it. Does he have an approach that leads to success? Obviously, they're in the Eastern Conference Finals. To get over that hump is when the player and the talent has to come through. Spolcher is a great coach. He is doing a phenomenal job doing what he has to do to get his team ready to go. But if Jimmy Butler doesn't go nuclear, are they winning those games? Probably not. And nobody's saying fire Spolstra. So I think people I don't think could tell you what the adjustment Spolstra is making. They just know that they're coming through in the end because their best players are stepping up. The Celtics aren't. That's not a Joe Missoula problem. That's the best players on your team problem. Well, and also, and and I I am a proponent of this. Kind of let Jimmy be Jimmy. Like, you know, I don't care if if Jimmy goes for thirty five points in a game. Let's let's say game three, Jimmy goes off, but not like fifty or even forty, but mid thirties. Jimmy goes off by even Jimmy Butler standards, and Bam still has his typical fifteen to twenty points. That's not why you're losing. If you control the role players, you control the Struces and the Martins. Like if Martin doesn't go, you know, by his standards, supernova in game two, all the while getting a lack of production out of, like you said, 60% of your starting five, you know, you win that game. I mean, there are so many different versions of how that game could have played out differently if you just got a little more of X, even if nothing changes on the Miami side. So it's yeah. not even that I think Miami is this you know uber talented like that the Celtics are the more talented team they are the deeper team they are the team that should win which is why for some insane reason in my mind Vegas still has Boston more or less at even money to come back and win this series I think that is nuts but putting that aside I just like it there, there's an element of undervaluing the heat for sure and an element of overvaluing the Celtics but I think all of it is just the Celtics aren't doing their jobs. If the Celtics simply play their game, just be you. Be you, the the you that you've been for 100 games, like you said. If right. Be you. You will win. You will win four out of five. You will advance. But they have not been able to do it these first two games. Yeah, I would say the formula for the Heat is they have to overachieve, right? They need 13 and a quarter from Max Struess in game one. They need, you know, 25 playoff career high from Caleb Martin in game two. They're getting that large in part because the Celtics defense has been horrible. But if those guys are their normal selves, it's not enough. On the Celtics side, they have been massively underachieving. They just need to get back to their neutral is good enough to be the Heat's neutral. The issue is the Celtics underachieving is not good enough to beat an overachieving heat, right? You watch them play. Everyone always says, oh, the Celtics are the most talented team. They don't look it, right? Like, oh, they're the better team. Says who? They haven't been the better team through two games. So, yes, if you're looking at it by their 2K rating or their fantasy basketball stuff, like, sure. But Caleb Martin is playing better than Jalen Brown, regardless yeah. of Jalen being all NBA. You know, Gabe Vincent is making more of a late game impact than your starting point guard and Marcus Smart. Bam Adebayo is outplaying both of your main big men. So while there's this idea that, oh, the Celtics are so much better and talented, it's kind of like what we ran into with the Warriors. It's like you're not beating this team, so you can't say that you're the better team right now. You have the opportunity to prove it because there's 
you know, more games left, but you're not going to do it playing the style of basketball that they're playing. They're playing like a team that deserves to be swept. Miami's playing like a team that wants to win the title. Tell you what too, man. And like, we don't really need to talk about this all that much because it's, it's something that may not happen. If it does happen, we will have time to talk about it in, in future shows, but and this is not a reflection of what we've seen two games in both East and West. This is a, a playoff sample size. Even if Boston overcomes this and gets to the NBA finals, I'm inclined to believe it's Denver's year anyway. Maybe. I mean, watching them play, I mean, it's Jokic is what, 28, 29, something like that. He's in that prime era. They're, you know, they're getting great contributions. They have a legitimate home court advantage. Um, when they play defense, they're they're a beast. But we know, but I truly think at their potential, the Celtics are as good as any team in the NBA. The problem is you can rely on like when's the last time Nikola Jokic had a playoff stinker? Like you can make the case that his game two was a playoff stinker, and, and he, he had, had a triple double. Four, yeah, he had a triple double. Right? Like think of it this way: Jokic, like Tatum has not made a field goal in the fourth quarter of these conference finals. Does it feel like their impacts are the same in how their <laughs> games are turning out? It's not even close. Yeah. And he has bad turnovers late in games too, but he finds a way. He rebounds. He creates spacing. He creates opportunities for others. Tatum can only do so much, but like you can rely on Jokic. You can rely, you know, maybe Murray is a little bit more up and down, you know, but – it could just be their year, but I just think that at the Celtics stealing, they're as good as any team that has a chance to win. But it's the fact that they refuse to play at least neutral, which is going to potentially cost them that chance. So this next game is, well, as we sit here tomorrow, I don't know if people will be listening on Saturday. So maybe you're listening the morning of game day, whatever the case. Sunday is game three and these teams, they're they're going every other day. So Sunday, Tuesday. So odds are we will not do our next show until after game four, which I'm hoping the Celtics are still alive at that point. And in a dream world, it's 2-2 going back to the garden. Is, you know, what needs to happen in game three? Like I, I said to someone earlier that that for me, even if they win game three, I'm not sure how much that is going to change my overall mindset about the series unless they win decisively. Like it needs to be a double digit game to win I in Miami for, for me I, to feel good. You just need a win, period. And I don't care. You don't get bonus points for blowing a team out. You don't get bonus points for hitting a game winner. What matters? You get some you confidence, can't. though. But you can't. The confidence is you didn't fall down 3 0, which is legitimately a death sentence, right? Mm -hmm. I think it can't, the split can't be. Lose game three, win game four. I yeah. think if you're going to split, it has to be because just the psychological mindset of being 3 0 to 3 1, like I think that matters. I think if you go in, you, you, you win on game three, even if you lose game four, teams have come back from 3 1 before. I think if you get down 3 0, that I think mentally, that's just that's the wrap. So for me, I think we all want two two. Right? You could tell me that they could blow out both games, come back two two, then lose game five, but win game six. Like everything is on the table, but it all starts with winning game three. I think as long as they don't try to win both games tomorrow, right? Like the old Brad Stevens line: you don't need a home run, you need a single. Like yeah. just win. Win the first quarter, then win the second quarter, then win the third quarter. Like, you can't think that there's going to be one win that brings you back into the series or even changes the momentum. And you can't just expect that because you're good on the road and bad at home that you'll take care of it on the road. But I do think that they they can win game three. Like, we've seen – they just did it in Philly. Like, they have the ability to bounce back. I just – they can't have the split be game four. They have to win game three. All right. So all of that said, before I let you go, is there one specific thing, whether it surrounds a certain player or the team overall, is there one specific thing you are looking for in game three? Turnovers. Same story. It'll always be turnovers against Miami because that tells us two things. If they don't turn the ball over, that means that Tatum and Brown are probably having a pretty good game. 
And when they have pretty good games, the Celtics tend to win. It means that you're not getting out in transition. You're, you're making the Heat repeatedly beat you in the half court. And I think, you know, they've given up 42 points off turnovers in two games. You cannot win on the road if you're careless and you just give and waste possessions. So for me, it's always going to come back to turnovers and stops. Let the offense be what it is. If you can't guard your yard and take care of the ball, nothing else matters. Greeny, I hope we get to do this again this postseason. I help a few. I help a couple times. That's not. <laughs> that's not limited to one more. I'm hoping for a couple more. That would be nice. That would be great. Dan Greenberg, Barstool Sports, of course. Uh, Ev Valenti, not on this particular show, but he is part of it. So thanks to Ev for all his work behind the scenes. I'm Adam Kaufman. Like I said, next show will come at you probably after Game Four. So uh, let let us hope. That all goes well, and we're coming back talking about a best of three at that point between Boston and Miami. Thanks. Rate, review, subscribe. Find us wherever you get your podcasts. We'll talk to you again soon. Enjoy the rest of the weekend. CLNS Media Celtics coverage is brought to you by FanDuel. New customers get a no-sweat first bet up to $1,000. That's bonus bets back if your first bet doesn't win. 